when we deal with muhkamat, we're dealing with what is halal, what is haram. Uh, we're dealing with punishments, uh, inheritance, wa'ad and wa'id, promise and threat. But when we deal with mutashabihat, we're looking at the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala primarily. Okay? So when it comes to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to these verses that are mutashabihat, there's two ways of interpreting them. So remember, with the Qur'an, there's an, an outward aspect, a dahiri aspect. Imam Ghazali says in the Mishkat al-Anwar, وَلِلْ Qur'ani dahir wal batin With the Qur'an, there is an outward aspect, you can say exoteric aspect, right? And there is an esoteric aspect, a batin aspect, to every verse in the Qur'an. Now, so when we deal with tafsir, we're looking at the dahir aspect. We're explicating upon something that is related to ahkam, related to the sacred law. But when we come across a verse that seems to indicate tashbih, anthropomorphism, there's really two methods. There's the way of the salaf and the way of the khalaf. Who are the salaf? Does anyone know? The early predecessors. Right, the first three or four generations of Muslims. When they come across a verse that is from the mutashabihat, what they would do is they would do something called tafweed, tafweed, which means they would uh, entrust the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Entrust the meaning, right? So, yadullahi fawqa aidihim, for example. The yad of Allah, the hand of Allah is above their hands. They would make tafweed. They would say, it's a three-step process. They would say, when you hear that, Yadullah, the first thing you do is detach from your mind any sense of Allah resembling creation. That's the first thing you do. Detach from your mind any sense, any inkling of comparing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to creation. And then you entrust the meaning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, you say, this means whatever Allah wills it to mean, what is uh, according to his greatness and majesty. And then you affirm transcendence. This is the third step. You affirm tanzil, that Allah is completely dissimilar to his creation. This was the way of the salaf. There are exceptions. Ibn Abbas, from the salaf, he would make ta'wil. This is the other way of looking at these verses. Right? Ta'wil then is mystical exegesis. So you have tafsir. Am I losing people here? Tafsir. I feel like I'm losing people here. You have tafsir. Okay, let me start over. Tafsir is commenting upon verses in the Quran that deal with clear injunctions. You know, kutiba alaykum siyam. Fast. It's been prescribed upon you. Right? You might say, okay, I have to fast now. It's clear. It's very easy to understand. Kutiba alaykum siyam. Right? But then you say, well, how do I fast? What if this happens? There's Masail. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I sleep through Fajr? What if I forget? What if, you know, right? So this requires tafsir, right? But verses that deal with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most ulama don't call this tafsir. They say it's ta'wil, right? Ta'wil means to interpret the verse, but affirming transcendence. So Yadullah, according to Ibn Abbas, he says this means the protective power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they always say, Allahu Alam. They affirm transcendence at the end of the day. Now, there's three types of tafsir. There's three types, according to our methodology. There's tafsir bil, bil riwayah. Bil riwayah. Okay? This is the best type of tafsir of the Quran. Bil riwayah. Tafsir by transmission, by means of transmission. This is the best type of tafsir. And there are four levels of this. We'll get to this in a minute, inshallah ta'ala. The second type is called birra'i. Birra'i. Or bil ijtihad. Tafsir by sound opinion. By sound opinion. Ijtihad is rigorous, rigorous scholarship. Someone who is a mujtahid has mastered several ulum and is in a position authoritatively to comment about the Quran. The third type of tafsir is called bil ishara. Tafsir bil ishara. This is by an indication. This is mystical exegesis. This is 
tatwil, and can only be performed again by authoritative scholars, people who have the requisite knowledge. And as a side note, also, uh, Arabic is extremely important. I mean, there's 15, 13 to 15 disciplines that one must master in order to comment upon the Quran, and uh, in, in order for his commentary to be authoritative. One of them, obviously, is Arabic. And there's sarf and nahu and balagha, there's grammar, morphology, there's rhetoric. Because we believe that the Qur'an is the very words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He chose every letter of the Qur'an. <clears throat> so the Prophet sallallahu this is different than what Christians say about the Bible. Christians about the Old Testament will say that it's basically like our concept of hadith, where a prophet is inspired by God, but then the prophet will choose his own words. There's a difference between hadith of the Prophet and the Qur'an. The Qur'an are words chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the hadith is inspiration from Allah, but the Prophet will choose his words to articulate the inspiration. Does everyone understand that? Is it clear? Hadith Qudsi. All hadith. All hadith, in fact. Yeah. Oh, hadith Qudsi is in the first person. Allah speaks in the first person. So the Prophet is still choosing the words articulate the hadith Qudsi, because it's not the Qur'an. Right. But all of the speech of the Prophet ﷺ is considered revelation. He doesn't speak. Never. Ma. Right? Ma yantipu. Very strong negation. Okay? So in the New Testament, for example, the New Testament is in Greek. It's in Yunani, the Greek language. Isa ﷺ did not speak Greek. So these words are not the very words of Isa ﷺ. They're translations. Okay? They're not the what's in, Greek, in Latin. It's called ipsisima verba. Ipsis and verba means the very words of a prophet. So the Quran are the very words chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So part of tafsir then is actually looking at the Arabic of the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose a certain word. Right? There's several ways of saying something in Arabic, like the word rock or camel or sea. There's several different ways. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose a, a specific word? So there, this is called syntactical exegesis, or linguistic exegesis. You actually look at the Arabic of the Qur'an and derive meanings just by looking at Arabic. That's probably one of the first levels of, of, of uh, tafsir. So, now going through these three methodologies a little more in detail. So, so the first type of tafsir is bil riwaya, okay? is by transmission. And there's four grades according to this interpretive methodology. The first is Bil Qur'an. Okay? The first and best way of making tafsir of the Qur'an is with the Qur'an. So, you read a verse in the Qur'an. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakah. Right? Verily, we have revealed it or sent it down in a blessed night. Okay? So the first thing that a mufassir will do is he'll look throughout the rest of the Qur'an to see if he can uh, explain this verse with another verse. This is the first level. The highest level of tafsir is explaining the Qur'an with other places in the Qur'an. Now where does this... Can you find a... Can you think of a place where this is explicated in the Qur'an? Laylatul Qadr, right? Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul Qadr wa ma adraka ma laylatul Qadr Laylatul Qadr khayr min al Right? So that's the first level of, that's one example of tafsir bil Qur'an. Making tafsir of the Qur'an using the Qur'an. There are other, uh, other examples as well. Some of the scholars, they point out, إِذْدِنَا صِرَاطَ mustaqim, Guide us unto the straight path. صِرَاطَ mustaqim. Elsewhere in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوا And this is my straight path, so follow it. And another verse in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, If you love Allah, follow me. So you have this verse, اتَّبَعَ اتَّبَعَ Right? That's used. So based on this type of tafsir bil Quran, some of the ulama say, the sirat al-mustaqim is actually the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, 
follow the Prophet وسلم, using the same verb in several different verses. And he's identified as Sirati Mustaqima, my straight path. And that's another example. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, Fatalaqa Adam Mirabihi Kalimatin Fataba Ali. That Adam alayhi salam, he learned words from his Lord, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. But if you read Surah Al-A'raf, that actual du'a is recorded. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa alim tafil lana, lana kunana min al-khasirin. Right? So this verse explicates upon the first verse. There's many other examples. I think those three will suffice. That this is the best, the best way of doing tafsir of the Qur'an is using the Qur'an itself. Any questions about that? Everyone can get that? So it's more of an academic lecture tonight. <laughs> So it's good to take notes. The second way is by the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you have tafsir bil riwayah. This is the best type of tafsir. The best type of tafsir bil riwayah is bil Quran. Next, you have the Sunnah. By the Sunnah, you explicate upon the Quran. <clears throat> and there's many verses in the Quran that indicate. The merit of doing this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa anzalna ilayka dhikra li tubayyana lil nas ma nuzila ilayhim. That we have sent down to you the reminder in order for you to explain to the people. In order for you to explain lil nas to all the people, the entire, the whole of humanity, what has been revealed down to them. And again, wa ma yantiku anil hawa. The Prophet doesn't speak from his own hawa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that whatever the Messenger gives you, take it. Surah Al Hashr, ayah number 7. Whatever the Messenger gives you, you take it. So, this is the second type of tafsir bin riwayah, is by the Sunnah of the Prophet. And Imam Suyuti has a long list of examples of the itqan. I'll give you just one example. The verse in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, ayah number 187. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَّبَيِّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْتِ الْأَسْوَدُ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ So eat and drink until it becomes clear to you uh, the difference between the white thread and the black thread. So there was a companion named Ali ibn Hatim رضي الله تعالى عنه who kept a white thread and a black thread under his pillow. And he kept looking at them while all the lights were out in his house. And the minute he's able to distinguish between the two, he would stop eating and begin fasting. So that's how he interpreted the verse, because that's what it says. Khaytul abyad, khaytul aswad, that's literally what it says. White thread, black thread, right? So he, he consulted the Prophet And the Prophet told him, no, that's not, what the, that's not what the verse means. You don't have to look at two pieces of thread, right? He says that, you know, the thread is the darkness of the night or the whiteness of the day, right? So it's important to go to the sunnah in order to understand what the Qur'an is saying. This is the second level. The third level, bil riwaya. so we're still talking about the first type of tafsir. Tafsir bil riwaya. tafsir by transmission, the best type of tafsir. You have bil Qur'an, then by the sunnah, and now you have by the sahaba, by the sahaba. And the best of the Sahaba were the four Khalifas, the Khulafa. Very little is, is actually recorded from their uh, tafsir or their opinions or quotations regarding the Quran. But you have a lot from Ibn Mas'ud, you have Ibn Abbas. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, actually made dua for him to understand the meanings of the Quran. Ubay bin Ka'ab, Zayd ibn Thabit, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, Abdullah ibn Zubair. Of course, Ibn Abbas is called Mufassir al-Qur'an. He's kind of credited with being the founder of this science, Qur'anic exegesis. Karjuman al-Qur'an, the translator of the Qur'an. So there's an incident that's recorded by Imam Suyuti that Sayyidina Umar during his caliphate uh, used to meet with his cabinet, I guess you can say, and he used to have Ibn Abbas come and sit in the majlis. Ibn Abbas very young at the time, maybe early 20s, maybe late 20s. Considered very young. So, and many of these men were Badri. They fought at Qaswat Badr. So very uh, senior Sahaba. 
So they said to him, why do you have this young man sit in our majlis all the time? So Sayyidina Umar said, I'll show you why. So he said to them first, what do you say about Ida ja'a Nasrullah wa fat this surah in the Quran? And half of them said, this means the conquest of Mecca, Fath Mecca, right? That's what it's talking about. And so then Umar asked the other side, what do you say? And they were silent, right? So they said to Ibn Abbas, what do you say? He said, they're right, it's indicating Fath Mecca, but that's an indication of the passing, the death of the Prophet that's what that surah, that's the essence of the meaning of the surah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet sallallahu that soon he's going to pass. And these men didn't know it, but Ibn Abbas, he knew this meaning, this nuance uh, of the surah of the Quran. So that's from the Sahaba. Then you have, so you have with the Quran, you have with the, with the Sunnah, you have Sahaba, and then you have who? Who's next? Huh? The Tabi'un. The Tabi'un are the second generation. Right? And there's a lot of tafasir from the Tabi'un. And there's really three groups of them. Three like major centers of scholarship. In Mecca, in Medina, and in Iraq. Iraq. Basra and Kufa. So generally the, the ulama say the Meccan Mufassirun are the best because Ibn Abbas is there in Mecca. And he has students like Mujahid, who's a tabi'i. Mujahid is probably the senior student of Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he actually read the Quran three times with Ibn Abbas. The entire Quran, every verse uh, went to the entire Quran with him. His name is Al Mujahid. You have Ata Ikrima Fatada, also a great student of students of uh, Ibn Abbas. The second group, the, the Madani group in Medina, the Sahaba that was their leader was Ubay ibn Ka'ab, and you have Tabi'een like Zayd ibn Aslam, and Muhammad ibn Ka'ab al qarzi and others as well. The Iraq group is split between the, the, the people from Basra and the people from Kufa. So the best of the Tabi'een from Basra is Al Hassan al Basri. And Apparently, he was a student of Imam Ali, Karamallahu Wajha. And from Kufa, you have Ibrahim and Nakhai. Ibrahim and Nakhai, who's also a student of Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa is also considered to be a tabi'i, at least according to the Hanafis. Okay? So that's the first and best type of tafsir, is tafsir bil riwayah. Bil riwayah, by transmission. What are the four types of transmission? What's the best? Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba, Tabi'een. Everyone understand? There's going to be a quiz later. <laughs> Just joking. So, the best tafsir, tafsir bin riwayah. The best type of tafsir bin riwayah, bin Quran. That's the best of the best. And then Sunnah, then Sahaba, then Tabi'een. Now, the second type of tafsir is called bin ra'i, bin ra'i which is by sound opinion, or bil ijtihad, by rigorous scholarship. Rigorous scholarship. So this is not mere opinion, right? It's not just when I say ra'i, you think, oh, it's just an opinion. I can give an opinion, right? No, by rigorous scholarship. So for example, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen. And he said to him, yassiru wa la tu'assiru, wa bashiru wa la tunaffiru. He said to him, make things easy, facilitate things for the people. Don't make them difficult. Give people glad tidings and don't scare people away. This was his parting advice to Mu'ad ibn Jabal. I spent the night in the masjid of Mu'ad ibn Jabal, which is just outside of Sana'a in Yemen. It's a beautiful masjid. Uh, and then Mu'ad said to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, well, what if they ask me questions and what do I do? I'm paraphrasing. And he said, go to the Kitab Allah. Go to the Quran. Right? And then what if I don't find it in the... Quran. So go to my sunnah. What if I don't find it in your sunnah? Use ijtihad. Use your opinion. But he's telling this to who? A sahabi. Right? To so someone who's extremely learned. Right? So his opinion is obviously different than the awam, the lay people. But this is a hadith that's used for the permissibility of tafsir bil ra'i, bil ijtihad. So, the hukum shari 
of a lay person, like myself for example, giving my opinion about the Quran is that it's absolutely haram for me to do that. It's haram for me to make tafsir of the Quran based on my understanding. Because several, several levels of knowledge have to be mastered in order for me to do this. And there's a hadith of Timnadi, which the Prophet says that whoever gives their opinion about the Quran without requisite knowledge has taken his seat in the Jahannam. So there's two types of this type of tafsir. Right? Tafsir al Ra'i has two types. Tafsir Mahmud, which is tafsir that is praiseworthy. So the Mufassir, he knows the Sharia, he knows Arabic, he knows other tafsir, he knows the Sirah, he knows uh, Asbab al Nuzul, he knows all of these Uloom, Nasiq al Mansuq, I'jaz al Quran, he knows all of these Uloom that relate to the, to the Quran. Okay? That's called Tafsir Mahmud, bil Ra'i. And then there's Tafsir Madhmum. This is a blameworthy type of tafsir, in which the person does not have rigorous scholarship, and so he gives his opinion based on his hawa, or he wants to placate people, or he wants to make a living, so he's going to try to impress people. And unfortunately, a lot of times, I, you know, I attend a lot of you know, gatherings, you know, interfaith gatherings and whatnot. A lot of times Muslims will get up on stage and give their own kind of personal Tafsir of the Quran. Right? It's very common, for example, with verse Baqarah, uh, Surah Al Baqarah, ayah number 62. Right? So, whoever, whoever believes, those who believe, those who are Jews and Christians, those who are Sabians, anyone who believes in Allah on the last day, uh, um, will have their reward, they shall not grieve, nor shall they fear. So, this verse is quoted a lot, like interfaith audiences, and people get the wrong idea that, you know, we're a perennialist type of religion, that you can believe whatever you want, and you, you know, you're going to go to Jannah, and it doesn't matter, and it's just a wrong understanding of the ayah. Um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, man amana, this is in the past tense, Whoever had already believed and became Muslim, that's one way of looking at it. Or man amana is a conditional statement. Whoever should become Muslim in the future. Right? So there's nuances in Arabic that people need to study. Uh, and they should tap into what the actual Mufassirin actually say about the Quran. So this is why the Sahaba and Tabi'in were actually very cautious about this type of tafsir. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, who was a great Tabi'i, uh, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, he was asked questions about very basic things, halal and haram, and he would answer them, no problem. And then he was asked to give tafsir of an ayah, and he totally ignored it. Right? And he's a tabi'i, and he's very learned, because the tabi'i were very cautious about giving their own opinions regarding the Qur'an. They were very, very cautious about that. So he would practice taghafud, which is like pretending not to hear something. Right? So here's a lesson for us, that if you ever go to a scholar, we ask him a question, or her a question, and they pretend like they didn't hear you, and you know he heard you, he doesn't want to answer the question. Okay, so don't keep repeating the question to him. He doesn't want to answer the question. That's a polite way of saying, I don't want to answer, I don't want to even entertain your question. So it's quite common amongst the Salaf. They don't want to answer questions. Because this type of tafsir, again, is a slippery slope. But it's still a, a valid tafsir, if one has ijtihad. Okay? So that's the second type of tafsir. So there's three types of tafsir. Tafsir bi riwayah, right? The best type is tafsir by transmission. The best type of this tafsir is bil Qur'an, then by the sunnah, then by the sahaba, then by the followers, tabi'een. The next level of tafsir is bil ra'i, by sound opinion. Okay? And there's two types of these, mahmud and madhmum. Mahmud, meaning praiseworthy, what the, what, what the mujtahidun are doing. We'll talk about some of these tafsir. And then there's a type of tafsir, the ra'i, that is blameworthy. Someone who doesn't have requisite knowledge is giving tafsir. And that's to be rejected. Okay, any questions about the second type? Pretty straightforward. I'm not losing people, am I? Sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself. The third type of tafsir is even trickier. 
This is called tafsir bil ishara, bil ishara, by indication. So this is interpretation that is beyond the outward meanings of the Quran. So again, this is more ta'wil. This is mystical interpretation of the Quran. These are uh, interpretations that occur to the heart of the mus of Mufassir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the heart of the exigent and give him these meanings. Okay? So mystically kind of inclined authors like this type of tafsir. Right? Sunni ulama have been very reluctant about this type of thing because there's a strong tradition of sanad. But Shia are very lenient with this type of thing because they believe in infallible uh, imma. Right? Uh, but we still do believe in this, that it's possible. Tafsir bil ishara. The Jews also believe in it also. They call it midrash halaqa, which is the, um, of the ahkam, and then midrash hagada, which is more um, spiritual ta'wil. Uh, so, to give you an example, in Surah Al A'raf, ayah number 46, uh, we're told about men on the A'raf. What is the verse? There's there's a rijal. Al A'raf rijal, right? On the height A'raf, right? This is a uh, ambiguous word. There are men, meaning there are people on the A'raf. So Imam Ghazali says, based on the hadith, that these are people that uh, that are Ahlul Fatra, meaning they weren't reached by a sound prophetic summons. Right? People that are safe from the fire. They're sort of on the the door of, of Jannah. They haven't entered Jannah. They will eventually enter Jannah, but a sound prophetic summons not reach these people. Or they're children of Mushrikeen. They're people that don't have taklif established. There's no responsibility upon them to believe. Right? Imam Sayyuti says, also based on the hadith, these are people whose good deeds and bad deeds are equal. Right? They're equal. But eventually they go into Jannah. But interestingly, Imam al study he makes ta'wil of this ayah. Imam al study who's a mujtahid. He actually says, that's the outward meaning of the ayah. Men on the A'raf. But he says, look at the word A'raf. It comes from Ma'rifa. And Ma'rifa is the greatest type of knowledge. So he's making tafsir bil ishara. That these men on the A'raf, these are people who have attained the greatest type of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're people of ma'rifa. They're people that have mastered haqiqa and sharia. So this is something that is by ishara, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him. Whether it's true or not, Allah ta'ala alam. But this type of tafsir does exist uh, amongst the, uh, the ulama. Imam of Junaid, for example, he says when Musa alayhi salam was told, ikhla'na alayk, take off your sandals, he says the first sandal is the dunya, the second sandal is al-akhirah. Take off the two worlds and focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's tafsir bil ishara. Imam Junaid has many of these types of things. He also notices in the command or the, uh, the conversation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has with Musa alayhi salam, inni anallah. He notices that ana is repeated twice, inni anallah. And he says that also occurs in the Torah. What is the meaning of that? And he says this means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can truly say ana. So this is a mystical interpretation. Ana meaning I am. Right? Okay? So, in summary, three types of tafsir. What are they? Bil, riwayah, bil ra'i, bil ishara. Which one's the best? Bil Riwaya. Good. Which one out of the ones Bil Riwaya is the best? Bil Quran. Good. Okay? So I hope you remember that, inshallah. I know you guys have great memories. Usually the, the, the men don't take notes because they have such great memory. <laughs> Women take notes. Now, there's also something called Israeliyat. Israeliyat. These are sources of Ahlul Kitab, okay? Israelite tradition, like the Bible, okay? So these traditions were used very, very little by the Sahaba. They didn't really go into 
like the Ba'ath. Uh, even more by those who came after the, the Tabi'een, like Wahab ibn Munabbih. Imam Ghazali, for example, is a medieval scholar. He quotes the Bible a lot, actually, in the Ihya al Muddin. He'll quote from the Gospel of Matthew. He quotes a lot from Isa alayhi salam, sometimes from the Bible, sometimes from our own hadith. But sometimes he does quote from the Bible. So the general rule here is that as long as it doesn't uh, contradict our essential aqidah, then you can quote from Isra'iliyat tradition, uh, but we do it with caution. Imam Ghazali actually wrote a great, a great refutation of Christianity uh, called Raddu Jamil. Raddu Jamil, the beautiful refutation of the divinity of Jesus, uh, based on the Bible itself. Right? He just quoted the Bible. He used the Bible as his proof text that Isa is not God. Ibn Taymiyyah has something similar. Ibn Taymiyyah has a book called Ratus Sahir, which is actually really interesting. Because Imam Ghazali, he said the Bible is corrupted in its meanings. Right? It's called Tahrif. Tahrif means uh, corruption of, of, of text. The Quran talks about the, uh, the Bible being corrupted in text. But what is the nature of this Tahrif? Imam Ghazali says the text itself is sound, but the Christians corrupted the meanings. So he accepts the text of the New Testament. It's a, called an affirmative approach of the New Testament. But the Christians have changed the meanings of these texts. Ibn Taymiyyah says, no, the actual text has changed. And this is correct. The text has changed. And he shows different uh, uh, manuscripts that say different things. Right? So they have this type of really academic um, engagement with the, uh, with the Bible. So generally then, there's three types of Isari Liyat. There's three types of, or three, three types of looking, three ways of looking at these Israelite traditions. The first is those known to be true because the revelation of the Prophet confirms them. For example, in the fifth book of the Torah, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, you guys want to hear it in Hebrew? Yeah. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Echad, Ahad. God is Ahad. Right? So we would say, oh, mashallah. That sounds like a valid portion of the Torah. Right? Allahu Adam, but it sounds good. Right? Isa alayhi salam, in Mark chapter 10, 18, he repeats this verse verbatim. Right? He or Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Those known to be true because the revelation of the Prophet says to them, confirms them. The second type are those known to be false because the revelation of the Prophet them rejects them. For example, if you read the Old Testament, you'll read about prophets like Dawood and Sulaiman doing things that are completely haram, that are mustahil, impossible for prophets to do. I'm not going to mention what they do, but even we don't do these types of things. We do a lot of things. But these must be prophets doing all kinds of crazy things. So we don't confirm these stories. This is obviously false, right? Or like in the New Testament, it says, Isa salam is crucified. All four Gospels mention, he's crucified. The Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُهُ وَمَا سَلَبُهُ So we don't affirm that either. That's the second type of Isra'iliyat. The third type are those not known to be true nor false, so we do not confirm nor deny. For example, we know that Isa salam the Ibnillah raised dead people. A person, people, right? Or Hilmota, apparently more than two. He raised dead people. The Ibnillah. The Gospel of John, for example, goes into detail in John 11 that this person's name was Lazarus. This was just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, this was just before he came into the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there was people there. It names these people. Is this what the Quran is talking about? Allahu Alam. We cannot confirm nor deny it, right? Possibly. We confirm the miracle, but the details of the miracle are not given in the Qur'an, right? So if it's not mentioned in sound sources, Allahu Alam, as long as it doesn't contradict our essential aqidah, we cannot affirm nor deny it. Uh, so that's, those are examples. So any questions about the Isari Liyat? Yes, sir? Yeah, how do the false accusations uh, against the prophets end up in the scriptures? That's a very good question. So basically you have different regions of Palestine that have their own versions. Yeah, the question is, how did these how did these false accusations against prophets end up in the Jewish scripture? All of these are in the Old Testament. All of the Christians affirm them in the New Testament as well. 
And the, the answer is because you have different regions, regions in Palestine who have different interpretations of the Torah. And some of these regions, they don't like the tribe of David. So they write things that are negative about David, right? So for example, the book of First and Second Kings, if you read the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Samuel in the Old Testament, they mention all of these things about Dawud and Sulaiman that are completely uh, erroneous. They do crazy things, types of sins that are ajib and ghalib types of, of sins that we wouldn't ascribe to our worst enemies. But the same stories uh, are told in different books in the Bible, and those things are not mentioned. First and Second Chronicles do not mention that David did this and that, and Solomon did this and that. It's because you have these different factions, right? These different factions, different interpretations that are fueled by theological differences, political differences, right? So people slander. It happens today in politics, right? Obama's a illegal alien. He's a Muslim, right? It's just not true. But if you want to rewrite history, right? If you want your opinion to be uh, the dominant opinion, because history is written by those who right, win the day, Right? So that's what happened with the Old Testament. You have stories that contradict one another because they're written by different authors. Yes? It's uh, reading of Bukhatir. I noticed that it's a lot of Israeli. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get to Ibn Kathir. Yeah, inshallah. Yes. So, Ibn Taymiyyah, he quotes Ibn Abbas, and he says, Ibn Abbas says, there's four aspects of Tafsir. Four aspects. The aspect that the Arabs know because of their language, that's one aspect. The Arabs know it because of their language. And then there's a second aspect of tafsir, the ignorance of which no one is excused. What is halal, what is haram, what is fart, what is haram. Every Muslim has to know this. Every Muslim has to know what is, what is fart and what is haram in his religion. You have to know this as every single Muslim, whether you're Arab or not. There's no excuse for ignorance. You have to know something of the tafsir of the Qur'an. The third type is tafsir which only the scholars know. And they'll share with the people if they want. They should. The fourth type of, is tafsir la ya'lamuhu illallah. Nobody knows it except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Like the huruf al right? You have these letters. We'll talk about this later. Because there's one in Surah Qalam. The first one comes in Surah Al-Qalam, Noon. You know, what does that mean? Nobody knows. Some of the Mufassirin, they have opinions, but they always say, Allahu A'lam. Allah knows really, in reality, what these letters mean. So now we get to the tafsir literature. What time do I have to end, inshallah? It's 9.30 right now. What time is the show? So, classical Quranic exegesis. So you should write these down. These are important. The oldest available tafsir is attributed to Ibn Abbas, who died in 68 Hijri. But many scholars question the authenticity of this tafsir and whether he actually wrote a tafsir or not. It may be pseudonymously ascribed to him, meaning students later on that were part of his madhab of tafsir wrote a tafsir, and over the years it was ascribed retrospectively back to Ibn Abbas. So there's a lot of question about, did Ibn Abbas actually write this tafsir? The meanings are sound. That's not the question. The meanings are fine. The question is, did Ibn Abbas actually write this tafsir? There's a difference of opinion. There's also a tafsir of Mujahid, his, his student, his best student, Mujahid, who died in 104 Hijri. What's considered to be the magnum opus of all tafsir, right? This is a masterpiece. Is a tafsir by Ibn Jarir at Tabari, Imam at Tabari, who died 310 Hijri or 922 Miladi. It's called Jami ul Bayan fi Tafsir al Quran. Jami ul Bayan fi Tafsir al Quran. Or just Tafsir at Tabari. Tafsir at Tabari. He also wrote the Tarikh, Tarikh al Muluk al Anbiya, I think it's called, The History of the Kings and Prophets. Right? Just an amazing large tafsir of the Qur'an. This is the masterpiece, according to our ulama. Right? 
So this contains tafsir bil riwaya, right? Quran, Sahaba, the Prophet Sallam, Tabi'in. It does contain some Israeliyat as well. He goes into some uh, Israelite tradition. So he does that as well. Later tafsir, there's tafsir samarqandi Tha'labi al Tafawi. The best of these later tafsir is an eight volume work by Ismail ibn Amr ibn Kathir al Dimashqi or Tafsir ibn Kathir, eight volumes, called Tafsir al-Qur'an al-Azim. Tafsir al-Qur'an al-Azim. Okay? So, the Tafsir ibn Kathir actually has more emphasis when compared to a tabari on sound reports. He's really concerned with, with strong sanad. That's why this Tafsir is very strong. He rejects Israeliyat in his Tafsir. He doesn't include them in his in his tafsir. There's a mukhtasar written in abridgment by Imam al Sabuni. It's a lot shorter. Uh, there's no English translation of any of these two. These are the best. Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir ibn uh, Tabari, not translated. If you go to alitafsir.com, there's a website for you, uh, they're all in Arabic on that website. Alitafsir.